when we get to the question and answer sessions, um, if you would prefer your identity not to be reviewed, please say so in the Q&A box, which is what you should use for raising questions or comments. But please do try to provide the information in the box about yourself so that I and Andrew are able to know and understand better where the questions is coming from and contextualize it better when it, he tries to answer your question. With that, let me get started properly with the seminar. And for this evening, we have one of the world's leading authorities on China's military developments to speak to us. And that is, of course, um, Andrew Erickson, who is a professor of strategy in the United States Naval War College. He's also a founder member of the China Marine Time Studies Institute at the War College. He earned his PhD from Princeton University. Apart from being at the Naval War College, he is also attached to the uh, Joint King Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard. He comes with on foreign relations and also the Haifa Marine Town Center in Israel. Andrew has published very, very extensively. And if I only restrict to mentioning his books, it will take much too long because even on my account, I am familiar with um, at least 19 volumes to his name. And there may well be more that I have might have overlooked. But I would mention two in particular. One is his most recent book, which is a co-author book on the PLAAF, the, the, the PLA Air Force Campaign for a Bigger Marine Time Role, which came out la uh, last year in 2019. And he's also the author of Chinese Entership Ballistic Missile Development, which was published in 2013. Now, Andrew is a distinguished scholar, but he's also somebody who had, in fact, spent a bit of time on a very small boat called the USS Nimitz, one of the world's most powerful aircraft carriers. With that, I'll hand over to Andrew to speak to us on the subject of China as a rising military power, developments, dynamics, downsides, and dangers. Over to you, Professor Erickson. Well, uh, thank you so very much, uh, Steve, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. It is truly my great honor uh, to be speaking with you today uh, and your colleagues and uh, everybody who is uh, joining us uh, online. And um, I greatly appreciate everybody's uh, patience. Um, uh, it, it seems that um, some of the some of the connectivity can be uh, more more complicated than expected despite uh, the institute doing everything uh, perfectly uh, i'm sorry that i didn't have a chance to troubleshoot uh, perfectly from my end what i'd like to share with you today are some uh, big picture thoughts uh, clicking through a number of slides to show you what i think are some of the key dynamics in china's rise as a military power and what are the issues that uh, come from that? And um, of course, uh, there are so many uh, aspects that we could discuss, but I trust that whatever we uh, don't cover in the slides, uh, we can cover in the Q&A uh, to the extent that uh, people are uh, interested. Uh, these are, of course, uh, just my personal views, uh, representing only myself as a civilian academic uh, scholar. And they do draw on uh, my personal experiences. Uh, Steve has noted some of them. And uh, this uh, photograph uh, on the bottom uh, right of the slide uh, shows me uh, with uh, the former head of China's Navy, uh, Admiral uh, Wu Shangli at Harvard University uh, several years ago uh, when I had the honor to help uh, show him around. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, just to offer a brief uh, overview, uh, there are always uh, so many new happenings and developments uh, with uh, China's military, with China's armed forces. It's always a struggle to distill and encapsulate uh, what, what it really means in the most important sense. But here's how I would propose to sum it up for you. Uh, please understand, of course, uh, this is uh, more of uh, an American perspective, you might say, uh, perhaps uh, a U.S. government type of perspective, but nevertheless, it's, it's my personal analytical uh, perspective. Um, I think over the last several decades, uh, China has pursued uh, military developments of its, of its highest assigned priority uh, very rapidly uh, to great effect. Uh, these tend to be associated with uh, the uh, outstanding uh, disputed issues along China's borders and its uh, immediate maritime uh, periphery. Of course, uh, different governments and different people have different perspectives on the nature of these disputes and what should or should not be uh, done about them. Uh, I, I, certainly, uh, I certainly understand that. But speaking from a military, a physics, a technical perspective, what's very clear is that China is able to marshal great advantages uh, close to home in trying to advance its military power. But these very same advantages drop off rapidly uh, with distance uh, from China. Additionally, I would argue that if you look at um, economic and demographic trends, there's a great chance that uh, China is already starting to slow down in its rate of uh, economic growth, national power growth, and uh, this will sooner or later have implications for military development. Next slide, please. But if we look at uh, where China's uh, arrived already today in terms of developments, uh, it's, it's achieved some pretty amazing uh, things. Now, uh, already China's the world's second largest economy, even by the conservative measure of market exchange rates. It has the world's second largest defense budget by any measure. So one would expect perhaps tremendous military uh, uh, progress. And I've listed some of these superlatives here. Uh, if this were an American high school yearbook, uh, China would have many of the so-called uh, senior uh, superlatives. Um, but uh, I'll just uh, go into detail in the next few slides uh, in the maritime uh, dimension. Uh, China has three major sea forces. Already, each is the largest by number of ships, and that in itself is, is quite significant, as I'll explain. Additionally, as I've also underlined here, uh, for the last 20 years, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense has been producing an annual report to Congress on uh, China's military power development. I highly recommend it. I'm uh, one of the few people perhaps who's uh, sweated through reading them all, and I think this year's is the best yet. Uh, it's packed with detail, which is based on uh, released uh, U.S. government analysis. And so I think it's quite significant that this official report states that in terms of shipbuilding, land-based ballistic and cruise missiles, and integrated air defense systems, China uh, has reached a level equal to or exceeding that of the US. Now that can be measured in many ways, but these are very serious developments. Um, next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, China has been engaging in a sweeping series of military reforms under, uh, under Xi Jinping's uh, leadership. Um, next slide, please. But uh, to simplify it, uh, you can really think of China as having three armed forces, uh, three different armed forces, uh, and each of these armed forces has it, its own subordinate maritime force. So pretty much everybody knows about uh, the People's Liberation Army, uh, China's um, military services, which contain uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy. Uh, quite a few specialists are also uh, familiar with the People's Armed Police, uh, which now uh, controls uh, China's Coast Guard. 
not so many people are familiar with the People's Armed Forces Militia, which has its own maritime component, the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia or China's Maritime Militia. So uh, this, is, this is another way of at least simplifying that organizational chart that I showed you. Next slide, please. Now here's a very significant uh, uh, set of statistics uh, from the US Office of Naval Intelligence, of course, I'm sharing with you a number of uh, a number of charts. It's all uh, publicly. Many of them are are based on U.S. government information, and in that case, of course, it's uh, it's it's publicly uh, publicly released. But look at the figures for 2020. Uh, already this year, uh, China has significantly more so-called battle force ships in its navy than does the U.S. Navy. Now. The ships aren't all equal. There are many ways to measure this. You might say it's an apples to mandarin oranges comparison. But still, ship numbers matter for a variety of, uh, of aspects. And this is quite significant. China's Navy is increasingly modern. It's not just, doesn't just have large numbers. Next slide, please. And then China, of course, has its second uh, sea force, which we just mentioned, China's Coast Guard. China's Coast Guard is far larger in numbers than any other Coast Guard in the world. And it contains, among other things, uh, the uh, two hulls of the vessel pictured here, which is the world's largest Coast Guard ship. Now, there are some ongoing weaknesses, limitations in aviation capabilities, for example, and we can discuss this all in the Q&A. But uh, these ship numbers have their own merits and strength and, and significance. It's not easy for any country to achieve anything remotely like this. So this is a big development from China. Next slide, please. And uh, for those who are truly interested in details, you can access this via the uh, US Office of Naval Intelligence, and you're, you're really going to need high resolution on your computer to see all the different hulls listed for all the different types among, of ships among China's Navy, Coast Guard, and Maritime Militia. But I just wanna show you one example. I've put a box around uh, just one set subset of Chinese Coast Guard ships. And if we click on the next slide, please, just look at the sheer uh, number of ships in this category alone. Multiply that out across that very detailed chart we just displayed, and you'll start to get a sense of just how many uh, ships China's armed forces has out there, uh, out there uh, in, the, in the seas near China and in some cases uh, beyond. Uh, that is really quite significant. Next slide, please. Uh, China's maritime militia is rather complex in organization. I'd be happy to discuss this further in, in the, in the Q&A, but uh, what I'd like to emphasize is that it is part of China's armed forces and it is subordinate to China's Central Military Commission, which is headed, headed by Paramount Leader Xi Jinping himself. Next slide, please. And uh, China's maritime militia draws on its uh, the world's largest fishing fleet, uh, potentially thousands of vessels uh, registered therein. Um, and here uh, in this chart, uh, just in uh, coastal Zhejiang province alone, uh, opposite Taiwan, we can see some of, uh, some of the units. Uh, this shows a whole other aspect of China's armed forces uh, development that few are aware of. Uh, next slide, please. And China's maritime militia perhaps plays an even greater role in the South China Sea. And here we can see uh, some of the units associated with Hainan province, uh, which uh, is uh, administratively in charge of uh, South China Sea issues uh, for China. Next slide, please. So uh, now let's go to the next subcategory. We talked about some uh, recent developments. Now let's talk about dynamics. Um, some of the key factors that I think are playing out that can help us make sense of this very impressive and somewhat overwhelming mass of detail that keeps developing and developing, frankly, in an exhausting way if you're trying to follow it on a, on a daily basis. Um, first of all, I would say, 
to the extent that any country has a systematic plan and is executing it in a, uh, in a disciplined fashion, definitely China is doing so. According to a hierarchy of uh, national security uh, priorities, or you could say uh, party state military priori priorities, which I'll get into in, in just a minute. Uh, this is informed by uh, the most uh, ambitious and clearly defined grand strategy of any great power today. Major goals and milestones for 2035 and 2049, including the assertion of control over uh, China's many disputed claims, first and foremost, uh, the most important of all uh, from the Chinese Communist Party's perspective, uh, namely, uh, namely Taiwan. This has already produced a very rapid build out of hardware or weapon systems and supporting infrastructure. The quantity is impressive. The quality is in increasingly very impressive uh, too. Uh, the so-called, you might say software or uh, su uh, human supporting factors, organizational factors, are more difficult, they're lagging behind. But here too, under Xi Jinping, China has ambitious goals and is working quickly to make progress there. Uh, however, on the other hand, I described uh, the, in terms of the larger factors, China is facing what I would describe as an S-curve shaped uh, slowdown. And I'll get to that in a minute. If we get to the next slide, let me lay out for you, what I see as uh, China's hierarchy of security priorities under party leadership, which comes before everything else. Next is party state administration, uh, governance of what might be termed the historically core Han, uh, Han Chinese home, homeland. And then beyond that, stability and ethno-religious minority uh, borderlands. Uh, you could uh, describe, for example, uh, Xinjiang and uh, Tibet in that category. Integrity of land borders coming next, and then moving out to upholding and furthering near seas claims. Now, I would submit to you that from the party's very founding and that of its party army, it focused on party leadership, uh, party state administration, uh, by uh, 1949, it had achieved uh, some ability to declare governance over the Khor Han homeland. By 1951, moving into Tibet, the borderland areas throughout the Cold War, working to secure uh, land borders. And um, then uh, uh, moving on to focus on uh, the current area, uh, these, uh, these near seas uh, claims. Uh, now, of course, China is doing multiple things, including out overseas into the far seas. But um, I, uh, I want to suggest that the area of intense focus now is what China calls the near seas. And I'll get to that in a minute. Next slide, please. So uh, here's, here's a map for you. Uh, Chinese strategists term the Yellow Sea, the East China Sea, and the South China Sea, the near seas. This is the location of all China's outstanding island and, uh, and maritime uh, uh, claims. And so it's no accident that China's focus uh, is there. Now, China has already arrived as a great power. I reviewed some of those superlatives with you. It is acting militarily on a global basis, but the intensity, the, the intensity of the China's actions and prioritization by area of geography in no way should be conflated. So I've tried to shade it a bit here to reflect a, a high intensity in the near seas and then some intensity beyond that, but it, drop, it drops off rapidly. My colleague, Peter Dutton, our former director at the China Maritime Studies Institute describes this as control, influence, and, uh, and reach. And so again, a very strong geographical gradient, even though China is already a global power and a global military power, uh, the geographic uh, uh, nature of the focus is really quite, uh, quite significant. Next slide, please. Now, the next few slides, uh, we're just going to see how various uh, weapon systems that China's developed and deployed uh, very much reflect this geographic focus. If somehow we could make a master chart that overlapped this hierarchy of interest together with the concentric circles of these uh, weapons uh, systems and their performance parameters and their range, we, we would see 
very dark or intense uh, circles or gradations close to China and an ever, uh, an ever uh, a, a rippling of ever less intense uh, focus and capability uh, farther away from China. So let's just click through these next few slides. We can look at, for example, China's impressive missile development. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a major area for Chinese development, both nuclear, but especially uh, conventional missile development, which by some estimates outnumbers nuclear missiles for China by a seven to one ratio. Uh, that's something I would really call to your attention. Of course, China does what it needs to do to feel it has the nuclear deterrent it wants, I, I believe. But the real uh, numerical action is with conventional missiles, which I think China believes have uh, a far greater impact regarding deterrence and the operational scenarios that are uh, prioritized. And uh, I just wanted to also suggest, um, I, am, I am happy to, to stay in, until uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time US. And um, I, I believe that, uh, uh, that uh, that that is um, uh, so. Basically, uh, I can stay uh, half an hour uh, later uh, in until um, uh, just to give us extra time. I'm I'm sorry that we had to uh, to to start uh, to start late here. And uh, if 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 Steve would like to uh, come in with a message on that, just to clarify for all the relevant audiences, uh, I'm just happy to to clarify that. So uh, please, I hope that can give us plenty of time for the Q&A. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this, so again, this shows some of uh, China's uh, very sophisticated and advanced nuclear capable ballistic missiles. Next slide, please, with the range rings, the ranges. But it's the conventional uh, missile and other types of capabilities that are by far the most numerous and uh, these cover many range parameters uh, that, that uh, uh, focus and overlap on the near seas and their immediate approaches, which, uh, which China is uh, concerned about. Uh, next slide, please, most. Um, and uh, these next two slides from a, a RAND report from several years ago uh, show just in recent years how rapidly uh, some of the performance parameters of uh, China's uh, missiles and supporting systems have, have expanded and improved. Uh, these, are, uh, the, these are, for example, uh, uh, surface to air missiles. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, this, uh, uh, back when Rand published this chart, uh, the, the PLA rocket force was still known as the second artillery, but you can see that uh, over, over, the, over the last uh, uh, two and a half decades, China has rapidly improved its ability to, uh, to, to threaten uh, various uh, US and foreign bases in the region with a whole range of missiles. And of course, uh, China is trying to do this from a deterrence perspective. Uh, I think the official uh, PRC position is if you would just honor and acknowledge uh, our territorial claims, there'd be no need to have tension or conflict. But since you won't agree to that, we're going to work to deter you. I don't think any side is anxious to have a war here. I'll get to that. I'll get to that later. But just to acknowledge that, of course, um, uh, whether a weapon system is, quote, offensive or defensive, uh, those can be two sides of the same coin, depending on one's perspective. Um, uh, I think uh, it's important to acknowledge perspective and not get wrapped around the axle, so to speak, based on different terminology and different, uh, different perspectives. I think we can all acknowledge that uh, those differences uh, certainly exist and they're, they're important to understand. Next slide, please. So I mentioned before uh, at the final uh, broader dynamic that I see uh, in play is what I would describe as an S-curved slowdown. I've done some work with uh, my former Naval War College, Gabriel Collins, uh, that's uh, available through his, uh, his current uh, place of employment, uh, Rice University's uh, Baker Institute. There's a URL at the, at the, at the bottom here. And, um, 
I haven't uh, told this uh, to Steve and his group yet, but I am happy to share these slides and have them uh, be available via a link if, uh, if Steve would like that. So uh, these are all things that will be available to people after the presentation to, to see and explore further as they, uh, they wish. So in this report, uh, there's a detailed explanation for why my co-author and I come to this analytical judgment. But if we're right, if we're onto something here, uh, this has significant implications for China's military development over time. What it suggests is China's made great progress in recent years, but it's going to be a lot harder for China to make a similar rate of progress uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. Uh, now, I call this category downsides. Uh, there are probably different words that one could use depending on perspective. But um, I believe that we've already entered a, uh, a, a difficult and dangerous uh, decade. China's already facing uh, mounting challenges, uh, growing challenges. I believe this economic slowdown is already occurring. Um, there are any, any number of uh, uh, demographic challenges for China, environmental challenges. Uh, we could debate analytically uh, where, where the trend lines uh, go in terms of domestic uh, stability. There are surely different perspectives on that. But um, I think from the perspective of China's uh, own leadership, there are great challenges. That explains a lot of, uh, I think a lot of the uh, very uh, the the world's largest uh, domestic surveillance system that they've uh, invested very heavily in uh, the various policies uh, and uh, uh, messaging that that they engage in China state media engages in so I don't think it's just my uh, opinion or analytical judgment that uh, China's leadership sees that feels that it's facing great challenges I think if you look at uh, their own statements and behavior, their own actions and policies, uh, it's, it's richly uh, reflected there. Um, at the same time, um, uh, I you'll, you'll find no greater uh, proponent of uh, intelligent uh, US policy and uh, values uh, than, than me. But uh, despite my great love and undying love for my country, I think I'd be uh, analytically uh, incorrect if I didn't acknowledge that uh, we, we do have, uh, we, from an American perspective uh, and a US allied perspective, have some regrouping, some adjustment and some work to do uh, to, to figure out how best to uh, manage relations with China, how to, uh, maximize uh, U.S. and allied uh, uh, capabilities. Really, uh, China's development and actions and policies, uh, among other things, have led to a very new situation. And it's not surprising that it should take some time uh, to, uh, to adjust to that. What's concerning is that um, China's leadership may see a closing window of opportunity. Uh, because of these dynamics I mentioned, China's leadership may feel that right, right now or with, within the next 10 years, it has some of the best opportunities to try to advance it, its claims before uh, the, the U.S. and allies coordinate even more strongly and before China starts to slow down uh, more, more thoroughly. And of course, uh, the scenarios that uh, are frequently discussed involve uh, the East China Sea, uh, both, uh, both uh, the Senkaku Islands uh, with Japan, but also especially with, with Taiwan, uh, the, the biggest uh, prize, so to speak, in terms of uh, China's, uh, uh, the PRC's unresolved uh, 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 territorial claims. Then there's also the South China Sea. And, there are remaining uncertainties. So uh, before we go to the next slide, let me just acknowledge uh, people often want to know, well, what are the probabilities in a given scenario or how would it turn out if it unfortunately were to happen today? And in some, I can just say, it's my belief that all of these things uh, uh, are based on a very complex multivariate equation uh, that hinges on a great degree of 
information that is not public in nature, but also based on things that can't be fully known to even uh, the most sophisticated government organizations. Um, uh, I hope this, of course, is never tested in, in practice, but the point is there's no cut and dried, easy summary slide. Next slide, please. One of the best things that's been publicly produced to date is the RAND Corporation's uh, assessment from several years ago. And what this boils down to is nobody can know for sure how certain scenario, the probabilities in certain uh, scenarios, if God forbid they were to uh, occur. Um, however, what is analytically unmistakable is China's growing strength in a variety of key areas that would potentially uh, uh, inform uh, how uh, key scenarios uh, might might play out in the real world. I think really that's about the best summary uh, that that we could uh, that we could offer here. Next slide, please. Uh, this just looking at the the East China Sea uh, and Taiwan, uh, we can see uh, a number of areas of of uh, of dispute for China, of unresolved uh, claims. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, in talking about cross-strait issues, uh, perhaps the most important scenario in the sense that the PLA has long trained for, planned for and trained for this scenario as the biggest, most important one. It's informed China's force development. China's, uh, ma the mainland China's made a lot of progress here. Uh, this slide can be easily summed up. Uh, Taiwan used to enjoy both uh, very strong qualitative advantages and um, uh, a good numerical position and thus had great deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the mainland. Uh, the, the numerical uh, issues have almost completely uh, flipped greatly in the PRC's uh, favor. Um, uh, so Taiwan is in a much more difficult position, but fortunately for Taiwan, it still benefits from tremendous natural uh, geographic defenses uh, related to the island of Taiwan itself, the surrounding mud flats, uh, the distance uh, from the mainland. Uh, these still are things that Taiwan and its armed forces can build on to great effect. And so there is, there is still a strong deterrent capability in part through, uh, through the, the support and the strong relations uh, with uh, the United States and, uh, and some other, uh, some other uh, militaries. Next slide, please. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, this is a fast, a fast evolving picture and these many overlapping uh, uh, PLA, PRC systems are going out in, in range and performance parameters further, farther and farther from mainland China's coast and creating more and more challenges uh, for Taiwan. So uh, this is not something to minimize. It's an extremely serious uh, situation. Next slide, please. Now, uh, moving on to the South uh, China Sea, uh, there are many uh, disputed claims here. Uh, we illustrate these in our CMSI co-edited volume on China's maritime uh, great, gray zone uh, operations. Um, one type of South China Sea scenario is that uh, China might seek, seek to seize more of the features than it currently uh, occupies. And um, in, in, the, in the case of the Philippines, for example, uh, this is a US uh, treaty ally. And so that has uh, significant uh, dynamics. Then as I'll get to soon, um, the South China Sea is also a very significant uh, international uh, body of water through which a tremendous amount of global commerce and energy supplies uh, flow. So uh, whether, whether it's a continued uh, peacetime, however problematic, or uh, God forbid an actual wartime scenario, uh, the South China Sea is another uh, very sensitive, very important and potentially uh, dangerous area. Next slide, please. 
Uh, this uh, from the latest uh, Pentagon report shows of, of the many uh, features in the South China Sea, uh, which ones are occupied by various countries, including with the tri triangles, uh, the PRC uh, itself. Some of the most strategic uh, features, and as I'll show you shortly, uh, some of the most uh, fortified and transformed uh, features. Next slide, please. Uh, for example, on the one hand, on the left, we can see from the Pentagon's report, uh, some of the many uh, mainland China-based or continental China-based forces that could well be brought to bear on the South China Sea for various scenarios. On the other hand, on, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we can see uh, a number of uh, facilities that have been rapidly erected on uh, Fiery Cross Reef alone, uh, one of uh, roughly eight uh, PRC occupied and fortified features uh, in the in the in the in the Spratly Islands in the southern uh, South China Sea, and um, uh, this th this this is based on uh, tremendous Chinese geoengineering of a reef, and on top of that, these many very relevant facilities that can facilitate all different types of. Uh, military operations, both in peacetime and at least until as long as such features uh, uh, were to survive in their present form in the uh, unfortunate event of uh, conflict. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, more from an American audience perspective, but I just want to emphasize how large the South China Sea is, including the Spratly Islands area in the southern uh, part. Uh, for European audiences, uh, you can think of the South China Sea as being roughly twice the size of the Mediterranean in area. I think that's very significant. And those familiar with Washington, D.C. can see uh, the size of the features in the Spratly Islands that China has uh, dredged and augmented, uh, built upon above the high tide mark and fortified. And then in the bottom right, we can see uh, how these features are, are, are networked in some very sophisticated uh, ways that facilitate various types of military communications and operations. Um, if you're, if you're interested in exhaustive analysis in this area, uh, these, uh, these graphics uh, come from an excellent set of studies uh, done by uh, Mike Dom, uh, former assistant US Naval Attaché in Beijing and posted on the website of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. It is a fantastic set of analyses and here you're just seeing a, a few of the many, uh, many graphics from that. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, finally, wrapping up uh, with the South China Sea, um, I want to uh, share one last graphic on the left from that excellent JHU APL report. What this, sh what this shows in a nutshell is that uh, China's uh, many uh, radars based on both existing and uh, potentially in development on these uh, features, can provide a very sophisticated overlapping coverage of virtually the entire South China Sea. And this could greatly enhance uh, China's ability to target various weapon systems with great precision. To include on the top right, uh, it's anti-ship uh, ballistic missiles, a notional trajectory of which is shown here. And some of those missiles were uh, displayed earlier uh, when I showed you the the conventional missile range rings. And then uh, on the bottom right, uh, uh, China's many uh, cruise missiles, some of the most advanced of which uh, in, the, in the middle, uh, in the middle we can see uh, the YJ-12 and the bottom we can see the YJ-18. So all of this has great significance. And finally, uh, even if as is to be hoped, this all just stays in a peacetime uh, sense, uh, there are many things that China can continue to do from these features, 
one concerning thing in peacetime would be to try to declare some sort of uh, set of zones to include an air defense identification zone and claim that certain types of operations or, or foreign vessels were not welcome in those zones in, in, uh, in certain contingencies or in certain contexts. That would restrict access to a very vital set of sea lanes and a very vital part of the global commons. That would, would be of tremendous concern. So I hope that the, the US and other like-minded countries uh, can successfully uh, deter China from actually doing that. I think that would be quite regrettable. Next slide, please. So uh, let's wrap up with uh, dangers here and uh, what this all uh, means and what might be done about it and uh, move on to the Q&A so we can discuss the issues uh, that are of greatest interest uh, to the various audience members uh, who have so kindly uh, joined us today. As I mentioned before, uh, the future is now in the sense that um, the most concerning uh, period for US-China relations uh, U.S.-China military relations, uh, regional security, uh, issues that I think are of interest and of concern to really uh, potentially everybody, uh, we may already be facing this because of the dynamic, the convergence of the dynamics that I've already described. Now, I personally believe that uh, conflict is uh, avoidable. It's not because I'm a starry-eyed optimist, optimist. It's because I believe that while the US and China have many differences, including unfortunately in political system and some fundamental interests. On the other hand, uh, they do have some shared interests and they do have shared interests in uh, avoiding war. Um, with all due respect, I personally don't believe in the theory of a so-called uh, Thucydides trap or the idea that uh, we're likely to uh, stumble into uh, a new uh, great, uh, a great war akin to 1917. I think it's just a very different world. Uh, none of those previous analogies or historical scenarios occurred under the deterrent power of nuclear weapons under the current uh, system of very sophisticated uh, uh, inter international financial markets and complex transnational uh, 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 supply chains and production uh, networks. I really think we are living in a different world, even though uh, much different from say Thucydides, not to mention World War, as well as World War I. Um, I do acknowledge that um, it, is still, uh, it is still a, a world of, of risk and uh, challenges. And I think that's why we need to maintain deterrence. And that gets me to the next point, which is, I do firmly believe that uh, the US and China do need to maintain dialogues and military, uh, military dialogues included. It is not a panacea. It is not going to uh, take on a life of its own that transforms everything for the good, transcends all the differences in national interests and goals and priorities. But it's better than nothing. It's the least worst thing that both sides can do, I believe. And uh, the important focus in my view is communications protocols and risk reduction measures. And it's not going to be ideal. It's not gonna be fully satisfying. It can be very frustrating at times, but I think it will be good enough uh, to uh, maintain some sort of contact uh, deterrence and uh, prevent an actual conflict through this uh, window of vulnerability that uh, we need to weather for the next uh, decade. And again, my co-author Gabe Collins and I offer further ideas on this out to the 2035 timeframe in our new report through Rice University's Baker Institute, Hold the Line Through 2035, which you can access via this uh, URL here. And again, uh, that's gonna be available in the slides that I hope can be made available to all. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, my final, uh, my parting thoughts, um, just so amid all these challenges, uh, what, what can the U.S. do? Uh, what should the U.S. Uh, do? Uh, what can the U.S. and uh, China do? How might we conceptualize uh, the larger set of realities and uh, uh, 
solutions uh, under the under the circumstances. Um, I've published over the years uh, using uh, the 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 term or the phrase uh, competitive uh, coexistence. Uh, that's a term that I like uh, that I've uh, I've liked to use. Um, I think like any like any term that attempts some sort of a a balance therein, uh, it attracts controversy. Uh, in the past, many people felt that the competitive part sounded too competitive. Uh, that's less and less, fewer and fewer people seem to have that concern. Um, and recently there's concern about the, the coexistence uh, part. Um, what I mean by coexistence is for the next 10 years and beyond in this window of vulnerability, from a US policy perspective, in my personal view, uh, the U.S. is going to have to work with the reality of a People's Republic of uh, China or a China in some form that has already arrived as a great power. Its very existence is a reality. This, in no, when I when I use the term coexistence, at least, it is in no way an endorsement of the Chinese Communist Party or any of its uh, policies. It is an acknowledgement of the reality of the existence of China as a big country in the world with uh, already having achieved all those uh, superlatives that I described. It doesn't mean that the US have to, has to embrace or, or be happy about those uh, things. Anyway, happy to talk about this later, but just a little context since I think people can read it in their own thoughts and maybe there could be some uh, confusion as to what my own uh, thoughts are. But I've, I've attempted to distill this concept into uh, four different uh, sub, uh, uh, sub bullets, which I, which I share here. Um, I believe that the US needs to prioritize uh, its, its concerns about uh, the PRCs, the party's policies, and really tailor and target its, its pushback, it, its focus, its pushback, its deterrent efforts um, to those uh, uh, specific behaviors that are of, of greatest uh, uh, concern. And um, I, I hope this could get us beyond what's been uh, consistently a type of uh, a, a PRC uh, or party propaganda saying that uh, the, the, U, the U.S. has a Cold War mentality and um, uh, is attempting to uh, contain China. Um, that's, that is not my perspective. First of all, uh, if you really want to use the Cold War analogy, as in with the U.S. and the Soviet Union, uh, the U.S. and China would be engaging in robust uh, arms control discussions that actually constrain China's weapons development and behaviors in ways that China doesn't yet show any sign of being interested or willing, uh, willing uh, to do. Second of all, um, I think the term contain China is not helpful, at least in this context, because my emphasis is, is not, not on attempting to suppress a huge country like China wholesale, but again, to target a pushback and deterrence against those most concerning behaviors. I understand there are different perspectives. I don't expect everyone to agree with me or to be happy with my argument. I just at least want to define that argument more clearly to, to avoid more of a sort of talking past each other as uh, all too often uh, happens. And I think whether we're policy focused folks or, or scholars or folks who are interested in the public interest and the public good, I think we can all agree that defining terms accurately and uh, uh, focusing is a valuable thing and an important thing in and of itself. Under understanding starts there and understanding is itself important. From a US policy perspective, um, I, I, de I describe in, more fully in this, in this article to the right with the in the national interest where I've laid this all out. 
Um, I do think the US and its allies will need to accept some more risk and friction and work to hold ground in some contested uh, air and sea areas, potentially also in uh, space, uh, cyber and across the electromagnetic spectrum, all these different domains where China is advancing rapidly with its, uh, with its uh, military. And the reason is because China is advancing rapidly and trying to achieve certain things. And I think, uh, I think the US needs to main deterrence through this, uh, this dangerous uh, period. That's, wh that's what that's all about uh, in my personal view. Finally, uh, perhaps on a more optimistic note, or at least uh, to try to uh, focus on where I think construction ap constructive approaches might be uh, directed, um, I do think that the U.S. should make an effort uh, to be attuned to areas of potential tension reduction and pursuit of uh, shared interests. But the key to me is reciprocity. Um, as, as with so many areas uh, between the U.S. and China and among the U.S. and China and uh, U.S. allies and partners and other key stakeholders, nations around the world, uh, key organizations, everyone who's involved, it's really about reciprocity. Uh, the U.S., its allies, its partners can't be expected to uh, make the first move, uh, pay a, disp a disproportionate price, uh, in the last 20 plus years, uh, 30 plus years of a robust engagement with China, there were many such efforts to uh, really make the first move to help, to help China out, to subordinate concerns about China to other, uh, to other issues. Uh, that, that dynamic has run its course across the political spectrum in the US. The willingness to do that has, has run out. And in my personal view, with all due respect, rightly so. So moving forward, for example, uh, when it comes to climate, climate change cooperation, that's, that's a big area, for example. I think China will have some interest in, uh, in doing something in this area, but I don't think that, I think China will do what it's in, what's in its own interest. Um, I do not believe that the US should make its own move in uh, say uh, sacrificing uh, support of allies and partners vis-a-vis -vis the near seas in, in furtherance of some sort of uh, hypothetical goal. That's a recipe for trouble because China with its very firm resolve and its very capable diplomacy will pocket, would pocket any such, uh, any such concessions and um, if uh, for those who like uh, American comics, comic strips like Peanuts, unfortunately, I think it might end up looking like uh, Lucy pulling the football away from uh, Charlie Brown. If I if I may uh, uh, if I may try to summarize uh, what is indeed a very serious issue. So anyway, those are some thoughts that I'm sure have uh, provided food for discussion. And if we'll just flip to the next slide, uh, I am happy and ready to take your uh, questions. And um, I, I have another uh, briefing that I have to hop on uh, in uh, just under 50 minutes at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But until then, uh, I am available uh, to everybody who's interested in continuing the discussion. So I'd like to thank uh, Stephen, thank Stephen his colleagues once more for genuine, uh, generously hosting me. I extend my sincere appreciation for everybody's patience and uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for this uh, absolutely fantastic um, to the force of a talk. Um, there are already over 35 questions in the Q&A box, so you can see the kind of interest there. But nonetheless, let me kick off um, by asking you, you, you mentioned something very important in my mind. One is that you talk about the mindset in Beijing of this closing window of opportunity. You also mentioned at the beginning of your talk, that Xi Jinping had introduced major shakeups of the military, significant reforms, 
which are meant to substantially increase China's combat capabilities. And in Xi Jinping's language, it is to make sure that the PLA is properly trained, organized, and indoctrinated and equipped to win wars. Now, that does not necessarily mean he's going to invade anybody. I'm not saying that. But the question that I would like to put to you is, how far and how effective has those reforms to the PLA, including the reorganization of the combat commands uh, been? Is the PLA now ready to take advantage of the window of opportunities if it is instructed to do so? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Steve, for that excellent question. And I'm glad you've used your director's prerogative to ask a very intelligent and on point uh, question. Um, there is no question that uh, Xi Jinping is a paramount leader of China in some ways, in a way that has not been fully approached uh, even by uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping, who took uh, some time uh, to uh, fully uh, uh, consolidate his uh, power over the military and to guide it through certain types of military reforms. Deng had other priorities, uh, most fundamentally uh, recovery from uh, de several decades of Maoist malpractice and to build the economy and develop China overall. So, so much of this depends on uh, Xi Jinping's uh, personal initiative and his determination to have a strong legacy for himself and the party. And on the one hand, I think that informs uh, the great ambition of what has been underway uh, with these reforms. I think it also informs uh, the timing. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, the many different publications describing both the top-down uh, policies uh, Im imposed on China's uh, military, uh, China's armed forces by Xi Jinping. And if you look at the bottom up reports uh, from China's military services and armed forces on how they're implementing, uh, we can see that it is a very sweeping, very difficult process. Much progress has been made. Uh, it is difficult to say exactly the status of that progress but I think that we can take very seriously the Pentagon's 2020 China report, which I commend greatly to all interested and which has a very handy executive summary. The Pentagon report uh, assesses that these reforms have had uh, great effect already. They are progressing well and uh, effectively. That alone cannot answer what exactly China might be able to achieve in what types of circumstances that we hope may never materialize. It can also not tell us exactly the calculus of China's leadership about such scenarios, which must be among the very closely guarded secrets uh, by a regime that is one of the best at guarding secrets uh, in the entire world. Nevertheless, what is clear is rapid progress to become a much more capable military, to much be, have much more credibility in potentially being able to address those scenarios of concern, including in a worst case scenario way, actually, for example, going to war over uh, Taiwan. Now it's the hope of China's leadership that various parties uh, involved, including Taiwan and the US, will see this tremendous PRC progress and be deterred. So there never has to be a war. But that is not in accordance with the policies that, the, that Washington and Taipei are determined to pursue. So here's where I see this playing out in terms of the time scale uh, that, that, uh, that, uh, that you mentioned, uh, Steve. By the latter part of this decade, I worry that we will be in a period of heightened uh, concern. I think the, I think the uh, the reform of China's military remains very significant and, and, on, and ongoing. And uh, before it is completed to a certain level, I think there's a reduced risk of China's military being employed because it's, it's not fully ready and up to the new standard of capability. But I think there is a, a goal of making that happen quickly. 
Xi Jinping is demanding rapid results. And I think uh, some goals will, are at least to be achieved uh, symbolically uh, by uh, the end of uh, the, the five-year plan and uh, in time for uh, the hundredth anniversary of the Chinese uh, Communist Party, which will uh, surely be uh, celebrated with tremendous uh, fanfare uh, next uh, next summer. So these are these are various uh, these are various ways in which um, I th I think that we are very rapidly going to see uh, just about the best capabilities that China's armed forces can muster to support their commander in chief's demands to be able to meet those objectives should they be called uh, to do so. And that alone is very significant uh, cause for concern. Thank you, Steve, for an excellent question. Well, thank you, Andrew. Um, for everybody, I am, because we started late and Andrew's Kanye agrees to stay on for a bit longer. So I'm intending to run this until uh, London times 6.45 or a maximum of 6.50, which will allow Andrew a little bit of breathing space before his next meeting. Um, it also means that in fairness to all, even though some of you very distinguished individuals have asked multiple questions, I will only pick one question from each individual and spread the uh, questions from, from other people. The first question I pick is from Dr. Casey Lind at Cambridge. And he would like to ask you, in terms of which branch of the PLA or which elements within the party or elsewhere within the government that will have the strongest influence on Xi Jinping and the Military Affairs Council in terms of the defining of the doctrines priorities and budget allocations for the PLA? Thank you, that is an excellent question. Uh, it is a very difficult uh, question uh, to answer. Among the greatest uh, honors in my scholarly experience has been to publish uh, two articles in China Quarterly. One of them uh, concerned uh, China's defense budget. And I am humbled by the fact that if I were asked to revise the article today, I'm not sure how much I could actually revise and improve it. It is so difficult to get information on that, uh, on that uh, subject. China does not even publish uh, a breakdown, a reliable detailed breakdown by service uh, in terms of which service uh, commands what share of resources. Uh, the closest Chinese official sources have come is to just show an even split, which is really not plausible. Surely it's not exactly uh, like that. Uh, what I can offer are just a few uh, thoughts about uh, key dynamics. We can certainly sh see a relative shift away in resources and prioritization of China's ground uh, forces toward the technology intensive uh, services of uh, China's Navy, uh, Coast Guard and rocket force. Among those high tech forces, which have been uh, better resourced and better prioritized uh, of late, one could surmise that China's Navy has even within that group, uh, certain advantages uh, for, for, for several reasons. It's, it's because it's relevant to the widest range of scenarios that are of, of importance uh, to China's leadership. China's Navy is of great importance to all of the near sea scenarios of concern that I've described to you. It is also at the core of uh, ch China's uh, global uh, presence. In between, it is surely of increasing importance regarding another key uh, policy initiative of uh, Xi Jinping, uh, namely uh, the so-called Belt and Road Initiative, which uh, some have described 
as a unifying principle, an organizing principle for uh, China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping. I'll leave it to other experts such as uh, Steve to determine that, but I would say from a military focused perspective, it certainly uh, suggests that China's naval support to the Belt and Road Initiative is going to be very important across the Indian Ocean and, uh, and even, uh, even beyond, uh, even throughout the world uh, to some extent. And China's Navy, in a way that the Air Force and the Rocket Force cannot, has both a very important peacetime role and a very important role in the unfortunate event of conflict. For all those reasons, I would surmise that by some measures and for some perspectives, if you had to pick one Chinese service that has been particularly aided by the developments in Chinese leadership decision, strategy and decisions, surely the PLA Navy should be counted there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Next, I'll move from the UK to India. And the question is, in light of the current uh, tension between India and China. And uh, Sahith would like to ask you about whether there is any way for India to effectively deter China, whether you're talking about on land or in his, in his thinking on sea, whether there's something perhaps that's the Indians can do in the Indian Ocean that could have a certain deterrent effect on China. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, question. And here I would like to underscore that I, I believe uh, the, U the US concept, US, uh, I should say it's not just a US concept, US allied and partner concept of a free and open Indo-Pacific is a very valuable term a very valuable concept, a very valuable theme, not, not the least of which because it emphasizes the importance of India. I am not an expert on India, but as someone who personally supports American policies, I cannot but have the greatest uh, respect and desire to work effectively uh, with India. And to my non-specialist understanding, that will be a partnership with many advantages that is never formally called an alliance. I must also acknowledge that my analytical focus is much more on the high-tech uh, maritime and aerospace forces development along China's near seas, uh, excuse me, the near seas proximate to China and their immediate periphery, as opposed to some of the other types of uh, security issues along China's land borders, which uh, have much more of a role for the ground forces to play. And in the case of China and India, involve some very exotic types of high altitude, low intensity warfare that really have a special nature all their own. They're, they're replicated almost nowhere else. So I find it difficult uh, to provide a, the specificity of the answer that this, uh, that this uh, question merits. But let me briefly come back to the demographics and uh, that I described in conjunction uh, with what I believe to be China's on, impending uh, S-curve shaped slowdown in national power growth. If one were to trace a, an analogous curve for India, it would be very, very different. Uh, demographics are among the most important drivers of uh, national power uh, trajectory, uh, in my view. China is already starting to suffer from declining uh, demographics in various uh, parameters. India is uh, virtually unique among the great powers in having extremely favorable demographics. I am not a demographer, but it is my basic understanding that simply put, India can look forward to roughly three decades more of very favorable uh, demo demographics, during which point its population will exceed that of China. Now, of course, that comes with its own attendant uh, challenges, 
but this growth trajectory uh, is going to be significant for India, its ability to afford a continued uh, set of military developments to include naval developments. And some of the demographic uh, tailwinds that propelled China are going to turn into headwinds in a very difficult way. So that is going to help India over time. And I hope in the best possible uh, partnership with the US. Thank you. Well, next question I pick comes from Jonathan Fanby in London. And let me also explain to um, people who have put questions. I will not be reading out all your questions. What I will do is I will somewhat paraphrase it uh, to make it easier and clearer um, for uh, Andrew. The question that um, I'm paraphrasing Jonathan Fanby is that what are the effective countermeasures that the United States has taken in so far as China's build up in the China seas are concerned, and what are they? Uh, thank you for that excellent uh, question. Um, China has achieved very rapid uh, military growth over the last few uh, decades. Uh, China has achieved great progress in the South China Sea uh, specifically. Uh, the balance of uh, forces has shifted very much in a better, toward a better position for China, both across the Taiwan Strait and vis-a-vis -vis the US and some of its other allies than was the case in years past. All of these trends are very significant and regardless of how one exactly calculates, they cannot be denied. However, just as there is a, a flip side to the coin of perspectives, there is a flip side of the coin to physics and larger technical realities. There is a flip side to the strategic operational and tactical options available uh, to, to various uh, participants in these, uh, in these, uh, in these uh, military uh, competitions. China has achieved such meteoric progress in part because uh, it has focused with great discipline on its hierarchy of priorities. It has pursued weapon systems that are unusually suited to furthering those priorities. These are systems that uh, Chinese sources uh, broadly uh, describe in ways that add up to the concept of counter intervention. The, the idea is to increase the ability to threaten US and allied forces to the degree to which either ideally they're deterred from uh, getting involved in a uh, conflict over uh, disputed uh, territory or issues with China or uh, should God forbid that conflict erupt and, and should uh, US forces get involved, then China would want to have a way of rendering US forces as, uh, as ineffective as, as, as possible from its, uh, from its perspective. And again, of course, the idea is to show the ability to do that and have that feedback into the loop of, uh, of, of, of deterrence. This has taken the shape of a wide range of land-based systems in China that some of my colleagues at the Naval War College call an anti-Navy, namely land-based mobile missile systems, uh, aircraft with, uh, with, uh, with a wide range of uh, missiles, um, uh, submarines and surf surface ships, especially with a wide range of, uh, of, of missiles. The sheer number of missiles, as I've tried to show in some of the early slides, is uh, truly, truly uh, uh, staggering. However, uh, the, the US uh, too can play at this game, so to speak, and uh, the US uh, has its own options in this regard. Of course, it's much easier to state what policy should be than to go through all the difficult efforts to uh, do the homework to enable it. I fully recognize that. But simply put, I do not believe heretofore the US has placed sufficient emphasis on its own missile developments among other systems. 
Now, finally, the US is placing more emphasis on that and none too soon. Uh, that, is, that is very hard for China to counter because certain types of missile uh, missiles are really hard for even the most sophisticated military uh, to counter. Now, uh, to, to inject a little bit of uh, uh, controversial uh, academic analysis into this, um, one of the things that was holding the US back from doing this and enabling China was the fact that since 1987, uh, Moscow and Washington were constrained by the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, which, uh, which barred a wide range of ballistic and cruise missile development. Uh, in, the, in the ensuing uh, several decades, China developed the world's most sophisticated and numerous force within precisely those performance parameters. Um, since Russia was already failing to honor that, uh, that treaty, and since China clearly has no willingness or interest to join that treaty and thereby constrain itself, I personally advocated that the US uh, should leave that treaty, which it has now done. Uh, for the record, I generally think treaties can be a wonderful thing when they're not unequal treaties and when the key parties adhere uh, to them. Unfortunately, this did, was not one of those uh, treaties. So it's tragic in a way, the way that the US is getting down this road, but I think it had to happen. And now finally the US is doing more with missiles, which was one of the very best things at the, the high end, the sophisticated, uh, the, the high impact weapons development. At the low end, in terms of peacetime deterrence and so-called gray zone operations, I think the single best thing that the US has done, needed to do, has started to do, and still needs to do more is to show that it is knowledgeable about the operations of China's maritime militia. It is, as we might say, wise to the game and that it will not be stymied by this shadowy third sea force of China, which is undeniably part of China's armed uh, forces. So um, I, no I noticed that uh, the link to my website has, has kindly been uh, shared by Aki here, and uh, I invite people to go there for further publications. You can easily uh, search and text in the archive for any subject of interest. But those are two things I would highlight that were long overdue for the US to do. Finally, the US is starting to do something on and is already, uh, already realizing significant benefits from, from doing so, however limited and late the start is. Thank you. Okay. The next question I pick is from a student in London. I just cannot resist putting a student's questions to a professor. And it is from Alex McDougall, who would like to ask you whether there are conflicts between the party apparatus, the party leadership and the state apparatus over security priorities. Well, uh, it's always a great joy uh, to uh, connect with, uh, with, with students. Um, that's one of the best things. And, Frankly, it's, it's one of the best hopes for achieving a greater understanding to have uh, more intelligent policies and ultimately a better world. Uh, one that I hope is better than the one that we're grappling with uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, I, I think that it is very hard to know authoritatively what exactly is going on within uh, China's decision-making apparatus. Um, the, the, the decisions in the, at the end of the day are truly made by uh, the Chinese Communist Party itself with Xi Jinping very much uh, large and in charge as we might say in the United States uh, and implementation occurring through uh, the parallel state and uh, military uh, apparatus. It is the party state and it is the party army that execute the will of the party. Of course, uh, going through the world's largest uh, bureaucracy, that doesn't mean it's always smooth or, or simple. 
It doesn't mean that there aren't some different opinions. I mean, uh, just in terms of operationalizing some of the policy uh, directives, uh, the party style in some cases tends to be very abstract. Sometimes uh, the policy is laid out in excruciating detail, but I don't think that's the case in, in, every, in every instance, especially when things are evolving, uh, evolving quickly or there's a new situation or there's a disconnect between different actors, there might be a lack of technical expertise. So we hear rumors about differences and sometimes uh, maybe even well-founded documentation of, 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 some, of some differences. But what, so the, the bottom line is a lot of this is case specific and in many, in many instances, I think it's really hard to be sure what exactly the reality is. But as with so many other areas of China military analysis, even if the specifics of decision-making aren't always clear, I think the larger dynamics usually uh, can be uh, can be uh, can be known so here are a, a couple of broad answers i would like to give uh, to that uh, question as i said i think a lot of the a lot of the confusion has uh, and a lot of the challenges come in terms of uh, in terms of when there's a challenge of uh, of, of definition and implementation so I think there's often a question from the key authorities in China's uh, civilian and military bureaucracy. What is the leadership intention? What is the intention of the, the leadership? I think this is a question that gets asked all the time. I think that that intention, sometimes that's a question. And sometimes there's just a disconnect and a lack of understanding. So to put this in concrete terms, there have been some international incidents in which the People's Liberation Army played a role uh, that some have argued were based on uh, uh, even not just a policy disconnect, but the, the PLA trying to do its own thing. I tend to be very skeptical of this kind of rogue PLA argument. I think it is very much the party's army under very, very uh, tight uh, control. Doesn't mean there's not sometimes a slip up, but let me give you one concrete example where I see a plausible explanation for disconnect as opposed to any kind of disobeying or self policy uh, formulation. Um, uh, 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 the, the, the January, uh, uh, the, the, the anti satellite uh, test by China, I believe this was. Uh, January seventh, uh, uh, twenty eleven. If I have the date, uh, if I have the date right, um, this is a case where, uh, as as this sometimes happens in, in 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 crises or bad PR situations, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was left clueless as to what was going on, at least in terms of what the spokespeople could say publicly, and it was an awkward situation for China because China had used a ballistic missile to destroy an aging uh, weather uh, satellite. And in the process created the, the single, it was the s largest single uh, creation of human, uh, human creation of space debris in actual world history. Terrible situation for causing uh, orbital pollution that could endanger satellites, a very bad uh, practice. Uh, so this looked very bad for China, and I can tell you how bad it looked. Um, excuse me, this was <laughs> this uh, th this was uh, January two thousand and seven. Um, so I was at the International Astronautical uh, Congress in Hyderabad, uh, India, and normally there's a huge, a large set of panels on orbital debris, and every single Chinese participant did not deliver a paper that year. And it was ascribed to some difficulty in getting vaccinations. I can tell you there was no such difficulty from my perspective. So what actually happened? Well, I don't know for sure, but the plausible analysis that I've seen is what might've happened was the Central Military Commission was consulted and uh, 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 signed off on this test 
by the general uh, armaments uh, uh, de department. Um, but whoever was making the decision, signing off on the decisions, probably didn't, had no way of knowing exactly what this was going to cause. Perhaps it was even raised, oh, there'll be a 1% increase in space debris from this test. Well, if you're not a specialist on space debris, that might not seem, that not, might not sound that bad. Um, anyway, that's the type of thing that I think can actually uh, happen. Um, I think almost never is there a real a rogue PLA situation. The devil's in the details, so to speak, but I do believe, generally speaking, uh, the party is very much in charge. Thank you. Okay. The next question that I pick, I believe, is from someone outside of the United Kingdom. Um, is from Asiri Fernando. And the question is about how does China consolidate its basing options, for example, in Djibouti and in more generally in the Indian Ocean? moving forward. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, an excellent question. Um, you can see rapid developments uh, in, uh, in Djibouti uh, of uh, China's overseas uh, access uh, points. And um, uh, my colleagues at the Naval War College have uh, published a great study on this, which you can access through uh, the China Maritime Studies Institute's uh, website. Uh, so I would, I would commend that. That is truly China's first uh, overseas uh, location. And this is already greatly helping uh, the, the, uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy uh, pro project influence overseas across the maritime component of the Belt and Road, enhance its ability and enhance its ability to further China's uh, interest there. That being said, um, I think really there's, there's no other access point, no other uh, basing approach that comes close for China uh, at, this, uh, at this point. Uh, in a distant second for now, I would keep a close eye on uh, Cambodia. Um, I think the way in which China and Cambodia have been denying what appear to be some very in-depth uh, media uh, analysis, for example, by Jeremy Page at the Wall Street Journal, it just, it just sounds a little bit like protesting too much for me. So I believe there will be some increased uh, Chinese access uh, to those, uh, to those, uh, uh, those collection of facilities in Cambodia moving forward. Uh, as my colleague Peter Dutton has done good analysis on this uh, subject, I, I think for China to really have a stronger Indian Ocean capability, it will need at least one additional access uh, point to pro provide more of a connection uh, between those, those two extremes or between uh, China's uh, uh, facilities in the, in the South China Sea. Now, where exactly that will be will depend in part on the geopolitics of the Indian Ocean, where, where India, for, for instance, has great influence in many areas. And also in terms of China's hierarchy of security priorities. If China went all out right now, of course it could achieve uh, overseas facilities access at a more rapid rate. But when you look at those many stronger Chinese priorities and greater emphasized Chinese capabilities uh, closer uh, to China's immediate periphery, I think this will cause a, a, a limit in how quickly China actively pursues that sort of thing, even if it does it to some degree by uh, increasing port access and port visits and doing what it can to bolster its relations with various countries in the region. Thank you. Okay, I think we are looking at the last, very last question and it will have to come from a SOAS student. And that is Lucy Scolton. I will not read out, Lucy, your very long question. I will summarize it and ask Andrew, and it is about Taiwan. And you talk about the uh, balance having been flipped across the Taiwan Strait in favor of China. And the question really is, 
that given that China will not be able to conquer Taiwan without dominating the air and the sea, and it doesn't look like that China is able to do so yet. Would you agree with that, or do you think that is not correct? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, it's a true SOAS uh, caliber question. And I think it's a great question to end on because it's such an important uh, topic. Um, I don't want to use the phrase, uh, the, use the, I don't want to, I don't support the idea that uh, uh, the PRC has flipped the cross-strait balance. I think it's greatly shifted the cross-strait balance from a, a, a position of great uh, tai Taiwanese security to a point of much greater challenge for Taiwan and its uh, its its uh, its various uh, supporters, uh, such as uh, as the United States. But if you look at the sum total of of cross strait balance, uh, each side of the strait has its own advantages. China clearly has numerical superiority of a wide range of weapon systems, great determination and an increasingly capable military, as I've detailed in this uh, presentation. But as I mentioned, uh, Taiwan nevertheless has its great natural uh, geographic uh, defenses upon which it, it can, and fortunately is, building with its, uh, with its armed uh, forces. It can take advantage of these fundamental uh, natural de defenses, which I've had the privilege to observe uh, up close, to make it very difficult to ever actually uh, uh, su successfully uh, seize uh, ta uh, Taiwan. The, the concept that I like is uh, Taiwan as an indigestible uh, porcupine. My colleague William Murray at the Naval War College has done some excellent writing on this in Naval War College Review. And uh, on, my, on my website, I have a, a bookshelf compilation of his writings and presentations that elaborates on this. He explains how China can build on, uh, sorry, how Taiwan can build on these great natural strengths, how it can do so uh, even more. There are very effective ways to do so even more than Taiwan has done already. And this can have a great effect. And bringing it back to the larger dynamics that I've uh, sought to outline uh, for everyone's consideration here. I think, the, I think what will be ultimately best for all concerned is to deter war through this decade of concern. I have great hopes that eventually uh, the larger dynamics of China's uh, development will cause a reprioritization of uh, national resources and policies that will be more focused on the individual welfare, well-being, and rights of individual PRC citizens, causing a reprioritization that will help everybody uh, live together in peace more effectively and collaborate and cooperate even more deeply across a wider range of areas than is currently uh, the case uh, that we can do uh, today. So that is the note of hope, of peace, of, of deterrent stability that I would like uh, to end on. Um, I will leave my slides and my website's links for any, any of those who are interested. I would like to thank the audience and uh, most of all for, for Steve and his team for kindly hosting me and uh, I hope to be in touch uh, with everyone in the, the future, and I hope we're all able to observe that it is a peaceful future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, Professor Erickson, for a most engaging and thoughtful conversation with many of us. Um, I have to draw this webinar to a close, but before I say it, good night, goodbye, um, so let me apologize to those of you who have waited very patiently for the start of the event. Uh, we will try to uh, take other measures to try to minimize the same uh, situations happening again. With that, let me thank you all for your participation and for joining this webinar. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew.